Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. Welcome to what is my favorite flowering plant each month video series. We're actually starting in May. I'm just gonna go through my phone at uh, the beginning of every month and go back in time and see what I took the most photos of uh, each month in the past. And for the month of May, likely because of Mother's Day and likely because they're in bloom, gardenias are my favorite plant for the month of May. I grew hundreds of thousands, not an exaggeration, of gardenias at my, at my nursery in the past. I grew them as rooted cuttings for other nurseries, as one gallon containers for other nurseries to step up into bigger containers, and grew them for retail size uh, as well. And literally in the month of May, uh, gardenias are pretty easy, to, pretty easy to sell because of their fragrance, their color, great dark green foliage. When we're talking about gardenias, we're talking I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, Zone 7B. We're typically talking about the species Jasminoides, so Gardenia Jasminoides. There are actually 128 or so species of gardenias around the world, most of them native in Asia down to Australia, and most of them are tropical. And so Gardenia Jasminoides is the one that's been worked with the most uh, in the ornamental plant market, and there's lots of different varieties. If you stick around to the end, we'll talk about some of those. Gardenias are in the Rubiaceae, or the coffee family, and if you look up close on the leaves, uh, you'll see that kind of same venation that you see in coffee plants, and then the fruit on it is a similar as well. So you, you, can, you can pick it out from uh, later, in the, later in the season that it's in that, it's in that coffee family. We're gonna talk about our favorites at the end of the video. I think we have about 10 or so that we're gonna go over that are some of our favorites for ornamental landscaping. And we're gonna jump over now and talk about uh, cultural practices and how to keep them alive in the garden. We're shooting this video right at the beginning of May and it's typically toward about the 15th of May when we start to see flowers open on them. This variety is called Scent Amazing. We'll talk a little more again about varieties later on. These are just great ornamental plants whether they flowered or not because of the really dark, rich green foliage. There's Apparently some that are hardy in zone six. I've never tried those. They start with swan and snow. I think there's several varieties that are supposed to be zone six hardy. I have no experience with them. Typically, I've always said gardenias are hardy, again, in zone seven to 11. They like well-drained acidic soil. So we have a clay-based soil here in my area and we mound them up a bit when we plant them. This is a plant, you know, a lot of things I just pop in the ground, I leave them up just a little and I walk away and that's how I treat most plants. Gardenias definitely do not like wet feet and they will respond very poorly uh, to being planted in, in, in a space that stays abnormally wet. So make sure you're mounding them up, make sure the area you're planting them in dries out between waterings. It doesn't, need to, doesn't mean they need to be bone dry, but they do like to drain between. Again, I said it's an acid loving plant, so your soil pH down below seven. You know, most of those plants that are like acid soils are heavy iron feeders and a lot of those plants have that rich dark green color and gardenias are not an exception to that at all. Most of the time people are going to buy these in full bloom. If you do buy one in full bloom, I would bring it home, enjoy the flowers in the container and then put it in the ground. Uh, that doubling down on the amount of energy it takes for the plant to flower and then putting it in the ground, it will likely drop a lot of those flowers or the flowers will brown out really, really quickly. It's hard to kind of do both of transplanting and keeping those flowers alive. So just enjoy them. Can be used at house, as house plants in cooler areas. I will say they're deer resistant. So if you, have, if you have deer issues, fantastic for that. But they do tend to get white flies, especially in the house or in areas that there's no air movement. So I think about the location in the garden being an area that will get a little bit of air movement because uh, Otherwise, we'll get white flies, which you can kind of do this on a gardenia and the white flies will just buzz around if you have them. And in the, in the house, even more so. Again, it's a place where there's no, not a lot of air movement. You need great light inside. Really, the brightest window you possibly have if you're trying to grow them inside. Growing them outside, the, the deeper south you go, they'll need a little bit more shade. So up here where I'm at in zone seven, we can put them out in a lot of sun. As you go further south, I'd put them in a little, a little more shade as you go. Tons and tons of different varieties, flower shapes, uh, mostly all white flowers. You will occasionally see some yellow or off-white uh, flowering varieties, but I tend to think that the, the white, vivid flowers stand out the best against this dark green foliage. Gardenias love humidity, so the Southeast United States is just a perfect place for them. 
These bloom on new growth and they can actually be pruned uh, when they're dormant uh, during the late winter and they'll still flower. It may move back the flowers just a couple of weeks or you can prune them right after they bloom. A little bit of pruning after they bloom or some, you know, if you pull off some of the spent flowers, most of the newer varieties will offer you some more flowers uh, by doing that. They'll just, you know, put on some new growth and flower again. Not as heavily as they do in the spring, but you'll see a few flowers other times of the year. This variety right here is called Diamond Spire. There are a couple yellow leaves on it, and I want you to pay attention to that. In the month of May, you're going to lose a few leaves uh, right about the time they're about to flower. This one is budded up like crazy. The buds are still a little small, so it might not be that easy to tell. But when they're budding up, they will thin a bit. A lot of people panic because they've got a few yellow leaves on it. If it's just a few, it's completely normal. If there's a lot, the, the gardenia might be a, have gotten a little bit dry. If it gets a little bit dry going into the time it's budding up, it will sacrifice leaves to flower, is my experience with gardenias. But this is Diamond Spire. This is one of the most unique gardenias I've ever seen. It's an upright, narrow cultivar. Has incredibly fragrant single flowers, like all these gardenias. We're all growing them for the fragrance, of course. Flowers in the late spring, and then again has additional flowering goes on right through the fall on this one. It's hardy in zone seven to 10. If you have a narrow space where you need an evergreen shrub that also has incredible fragrant flowers on it, Diamond Spire is a great choice. There are four varieties that are very common in the trade that you'll see being sold, uh, slightly older varieties, and probably the ones I grew the most of before some of the newer improved varieties like, uh, like Diamond Spire have come along. One is August Beauty, probably one of the most common gardenias we'll see in the Southeast United States. Large growing plant, fairly large leaves, pretty large double flowers. Some of the flowers on these gardenias are gonna be singles, I mean, just a flat group of petals, and then others have been selected for having a double, full double flower, more like what you would think of as a rose or a double rose or something like that. August Beauty's long bloomed, more vigorous in the garden. It, it can get pretty daggone big, and I've seen August Beauty gardenias as tall as 10 feet in height. So you're gonna see on the tag five to six feet. Plants don't stop growing, they don't read the tags. So it will eventually get bigger than that. Can be controlled some through, uh, through pruning for sure. It's one of those things where you would select, you know, if you're up here in zone seven, you don't want gardenias out on the edge of your property because the wind can damage them during the winter time. But if then if you tuck it up against the house, you know, you can end up potentially with white fly issues. So be careful in the selection. August Beauty doesn't necessarily fit a lot of gardens in zone seven, because again, it's gonna get big and it needs you know, needs to be in a space with some air movement. The, the shorter ones tend to be a little bit easier to hide in the garden from the, from the winter winds. Uh, next up, would my, my biggest seller of all time was definitely frostproof gardenia. It's a, a narrower, narrower leafed variety. Typically gonna see it three to four feet by three to four feet, something like that. Again, it's another one I've seen slightly taller than that. It's got great double flowers. I sold, I was one of the first people to have that variety in my nursery and I was growing at one time probably 50,000 plus uh, trade gallon containers for other nurseries to grow out. It's an extremely popular variety. There is an improved upon one that I'll talk about just uh, in, ju in just a minute because it has one issue where it will flop open uh, as, it as it gets older. Climbs Hardy, very popular variety. Uh, di slightly different kind of foliage, slightly more rounded than Lancelate has a single flower, but it makes up for that by blooming like crazy. And you're gonna see something like two to three feet by two to three feet or something like that on the tags. There's one in the neighborhood over here that's more than six feet tall. So again, it doesn't have, doesn't have an off switch, but Climbs Hardy, I sold just a ton of. Some people would prefer the double flowers, but Climbs Hardy probably gets double the amount of flowers. That's another one that's been approved upon and sent amazing around the corner. You've already seen it. We're gonna talk about a little bit more about that one. Uh, in just a second. And then there's Radicans gardenias or the ground cover gardenias. In several of these, you'll see variegated, variegated ones as well. So we have a variegated Radicans out here in the garden. The variegated Radicans and Radicans will, you know, they'll get somewhere around two feet in height and that's about max on them, but they'll get as wide as you want them to get. That one is definitely water sensitive and I would put it in a space where it gets where it dries out between rains and dries out between waterings. And I would rather be responsible for watering it when it gets dry than having the rain do it. Because if the rain is doing it and you go through a wet period for some period of time, they can really get into trouble. One thing I'll say about all the variegated gardenias is 
and they're upright ones, low growing ones. They're very beautiful. They flower a little bit less, and of course the white flowers don't show up against that variegation as well as it does that really dark green rich foliage. And I haven't seen one yet that doesn't get green sports on it. So it tries to revert back to green, and that green growth can grow back very quickly. Variegated radicans is worth having, but if you see any green come in on it, you've got to cut that out of there as quick as possible because it will grow much faster than the variegated, uh, than the, than the variegated plant. We saw Diamond Spire over there, which is very unique, has an upright habit, has a different foliage than pretty much any gardenia I've ever seen. It almost looks like a little uh, small fiddle leaf fig uh, uh, leaf on it. It's really, really, really interesting. And it being vertical like that and the flowers being out on the side of it, it's just so incredibly showy. So I went through like four that I grew in my nursery and there are a lot of named varieties and named cultivars. Let me know down below if you've got one uh, that's your favorite in, in the garden because I think I'm only gonna cover like eight or nine and there's probably, there are literally hundreds of named uh, gardenia jasminoides uh, cultivars out in the world. This one we, we were over here filming talking about uh, cultural you know, conditions that gardenias need. This one's called Scent Amazing. I don't know if I mentioned it at that time. Scent Amazing is like an improved Climes Hardy gardenia. It has the single flowers like Climes, but it was selected to continue blooming even more. So Climes Hardy will have a flower here and there during the summer until fall. This one really just continues to bloom. And we had a, I think we had a flower on this as late as November, at least October for sure this past year. So it'll bloom out heavy in the next couple of weeks, completely covered in flowers. That's pretty typical of gardenias mid to late spring. I put gardenias in the late spring blooming category. So we have lots of things like azaleas and other things that bloom early. Gardenias tend to be a little later about the time some of the hydrangeas are starting to show color in the garden as well. But this one's very, it's a little more compact than Climes. Like I told you, there's one in the Climes Hardy that's seven feet tall around the corner from us. Compact habit and selected to rebloom a little bit longer. Then there's a variety called Jubilation. And I would compare, say Jubilation is just a much more compact version of August Beauty. So it's gonna grow three to four feet by three to four feet, be a mound rather than a little more upright like August Beauty, but it has those great big, double white flowers that a lot of people are drawn to specifically. Again, I don't know that you get more out of it by having the double flowers. The single flowering varieties tend to have a few more flowers. You know, that's completely, you know, completely uh, dependent on what you're, what you're looking for to get out of your gardenia. They're all the exact same fragrance, exact same fragrance. And then another new one from the Southern Living Plant Collection is called Foolproof. And where uh, frostproof, I said, can get a little bit floppy in the landscape, it, it tends to grow really quickly and a bit thin. Uh, Frostproof was, or foolproof was picked because the leaf internodes are a little closer together, meaning the leaves are a little closer together on the stem, creates a much more fuller looking plant, and it has stems that are a bit more rigid. So it ends up looking much fuller in the landscape, has the double flowers like, uh, like August Beauty. One thing I'm interested in is if anyone has a gardenia growing outside in zone six because uh, I have no experience with the ones that were selected for, for being outdoors in the garden in zone six. So I think gardenias are one of, those, one of those things that people just can't resist in a retail setting. I will say, when you get home, make sure you're picking a space that, again, is well-drained. Uh, hopefully you're in an area that has acid soils. You want to mound them up uh, just a little bit when you plant them. Let them dry out between waterings. Don't panic if you lose a few leaves as they're leading up toward flowering because all it's doing is shedding a few, sacrificing a few leaves to really put on that big flower show that it's gonna do. It should flush, after it finishes flowering, it should put on a new flush at that time. That's when you would prune them. We fertilize once a year in this garden. Uh, they're not super heavy feeders, but if you have one in the house, you probably want to do fertilize it a few times during the year. And of course they can come outside during the summer months in the container and then go back in during the winter time. But gardenias are definitely from my sales in May and just the attention that gardenias have gotten from my cell phone photos over the last uh, couple decades. Uh, definitely my favorite flowering plant for May. What's yours?